New wine requires new wineskins, lest the power of the new burst the weakness of the old. Matthew 9.17, Mark 2.22, and Luke 5.37. The reality of the cross and the gift of the Spirit, thus of necessity, brought about an entirely new way of dispensing God's truth, the new dispensation of the church age. Lying behind the English word dispensation, Greek, oikonomia, is the Greek word oikos, meaning house or household. It is important to recognize this connection in order to understand the essence of the biblical concept of dispensations, namely the provision of all necessary support for a household, compare home economics, also derived from oikos. The Lord answered, Who then is the faithful and wise manager, literally dispenser, oikonomos, whom the master puts in charge of his servants to give them their food allowance at the proper time? It will be good for that servant whom the master finds doing so when he returns. Truly, I tell you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. Luke 12, 42 through 44. As our Lord's comments above tells us, the steward or stewardship, dispenser or dispensation, manager or management function in every biblical age has had to do with providing spiritual food for the household, the family of faith. Moses not only provided spiritual food for the specific household placed under his care at the time of the Exodus and for forty further years, but was also given to write and implement the rules for the entire dispensation thereafter, rules which set out the system for providing spiritual food for God's special nation ever after, until the time of the coming of the Messiah. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave though he is master of all, but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the Father. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world, Stoicaea. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father! Therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Galatians 4, 1-7 Christ is superior to Moses in every way, but for our purposes here, the important thing to take note of is that Moses was an intermediary and the means of his provision of spiritual food to the household for which he was responsible was temporary, composed of rituals and shadows which looked forward to the time of revelation of all of God's mysteries, that is, the revealing to the world of the One who encapsulates them all, the Son of Man. Through the cross, we have been liberated from the slavery to ritual and shadow inherent in the Mosaic law and have been appointed sons of God through our faith in His Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Endowed now with the Holy Spirit, we have access to spiritual food about which prior generations under the law could only dream, 1 Peter 1.10-12. Thus, House or household in our context refers to the respective dispensations of the age of Israel, from Moses forward, and the age of the church, with the former represented by the one given to be its initial steward or dispenser, and the later represented by the one who is master over the entire church from Eden until his return and our resurrection. In all wisdom and understanding, God has made known to us the mystery He has willed according to His own benevolent purpose, which He determined in Christ, for the administration, literally, dispensing, oikonomia, of this present fulfillment of the epochs, that is, the church age wherein the church is complete, namely, the incorporation of all things in Christ, things in heaven and things on earth. Ephesians 1, 8-10 Making clear to his readers this crucial contrast between Moses and Christ was of particular significance to Paul, because through this analogy he hoped to make the Jerusalem believers realize that they were retreating back to a greatly inferior means of provision. Worse to tell, that system of provision was no longer being empowered by God since its time and purpose had passed, Romans 6.14 and 15, Galatians 3.10-13, and Ephesians 2.15. And worst of all, by engaging with the law, 
returning to the status of slaves and renouncing their status of sons, won for them at the cross, they were turning their backs on the one who is master over all. So then, you are no longer strangers and hangers-on, but you are fellow citizens and fellow members of the household of God, established upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ himself the cornerstone, in whom the entire structure is in the process of being joined together and is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you too are being built up into a dwelling place of God by the Spirit. Ephesians 2, 19 through 22 the passage directly above, also written by the Apostle Paul, was addressed to a Gentile audience. Part of the mystery revealed only after the cross and the coming of the Spirit is that Gentiles are now full and equal functional members of the Church of Jesus Christ. During this household period, the Church Age, the plan of God is no longer being administered through one special nation, concentrated in a single geographical location, but is instead being implemented through the worldwide Church of Jesus Christ, with Jews and Gentiles co-equal partners in the Spirit. Together, we are being joined together and built up into God's dwelling place through the power of the Holy Spirit, through His distribution of spiritual gifts, and through His empowerment of ministries around the globe, where gifted Christians, and all Christians are gifted, are performing the ministries Jesus has assigned, whose effects the Father has ordained. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 6. It is Jesus to whom you have come, a living stone, rejected by men, but with God elect and highly honored. And you yourselves are being built up, that is, by the Holy Spirit, into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood for the offering of spiritual sacrifices well pleasing to God through Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 2, 4 through 5. This truth of the transfer of responsibility for spiritual growth from the Jewish nation to the entire complement of believers alive on earth no doubt helps to explain in part the reluctance of many in Jerusalem to accept the new status quo and their willingness instead to return to the now defunct law, Matthew 21, 43. For we know for a fact that the tendencies of this generation in Israel, which oppose the Lord, will continue until his return, Matthew 24, 34, Mark 13, 30, Luke 21, 32, and Romans 11. 25. And we also know from numerous examples in Scripture that jealousy over the inclusion of the Gentiles, which wrongly seems to some to somehow degrade the special relationship Israel has always had with him, was often at the heart of the hardness and resistance which Jews at the time manifested towards the gospel. For example, Matthew 27, 18, Luke 4, 23 through 30, and Acts 13. 43 through 45. What is particularly problematic for these believers in Jerusalem is precisely that while they were believers, their present behavior was anything but what was appropriate for believers, and that negative behavior was pushing them away from the Lord. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. Romans 10.12. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Galatians 3.28 These were hard words for anyone brought up with the notion of Jewish exceptionalism to hear, and the idea that the temple and its rites along with the entirety of the Mosaic law was now no longer valid took even the apostles a long time to digest and accept. So it is understandable that when the pressure of exclusion by their unbelieving neighbors was added to the mix, many Jerusalem believers found it easier, as well as comforting on some level, to return to their prior religious conformity. The Lord, however, was not going to allow this fundamental compromise of faith in Him to stand. Whatever good there is in the law, the unbelieving religious generation of that day were paying it only lip service as they engaged in traditional ritual without any actual faith, vainly worshipping him, teaching as doctrines the commandments of mere men, Matthew 15, 9. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins, the wine will run out, 
and the wineskins will be ruined. No, new wine must be poured into new wineskins. And no one after drinking old wine wants the new, for they say, the old is better. Luke 5.37-39 through 39. Times had changed, dramatically. A new dispensation had dawned. No longer was God's truth to be dispensed through shadows from a single central location. Truth now was to reside exclusively in the canon of the soon-to-be-completed scriptures. No longer were priests and Levites to be the chosen stewards of God's household. Administering God's multifarious grace now falls to the lot of every believer, since every believer is now indwelt and gifted by the Holy Spirit. This marvellous change should have been a cause of rejoicing, not one of sullen jealousy and retreat into the now outmoded and illegitimate practices of the past, which were even so not being properly conducted. 